Hello, everybody at uh, VCOP. Um, I'm pleased today to introduce uh, a pair that will be presenting the uh, Safe and Just Report for the Plant-Based Treaty. You may be familiar with Anita Kreins as the co-founder of the Plant-Based Treaty, or perhaps as the co-founder of the Animal Save Movement. We're not for Anita. It's doubtful that I would be here as an activist today. Uh, Stephen George is an Earth Observation Technology and Systems Engineer at the European Space Agency, EuroNASA. Oh, good, he smiled. <laughs> he's based in the Netherlands, which is where he's joined us today to share this uh, presentation that they've developed together and uh, relates to vegan donut economics, which, you know, is a subject close to my heart. I've presented in this space a few times before, but uh, I'll uh, let you take it away, Stephen and Anita. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Fantastic stuff. So uh, we've got quite a lot to, to get through today, so I'm going to jump straight in. Um, so before we really delve into the main subject of our presentation, um, I, I first wanted to introduce a concept that will help you understand the next few slides. Um, and what I would like you to do is just take a moment to zoom out. I want you to visualize yourself leaving the room that you're in and gradually moving away from the building, um, from uh, from the town, from uh, the city that you're in, from the country. Now imagine yourself going out further until you reach space, almost as if you're now looking down at Earth from, say, the perspective of an astronaut uh, on board the, the National uh, Space Station. My question to you is, what do you see? Now, we see a vibrant blue and green marble suspended in this vastness of space, right? Maybe what you see is this closed system with limited resources, where borders are just imaginary lines drawn by humans, right? Um, you may also notice the nothingness of space around the Earth as well. And this can give you, you know, the sense of isolation, the realization that there is no outside help. It's just us, humanity on this small planet hurtling through space, solely responsible for preserving uh, what we have on Earth. And this is Spaceship Earth. This is a metaphorical concept that helps capture the idea that the Earth is like a spaceship traveling through space and it's supporting human life and everything within it. And just like an actual spaceship going on, let's say an, an intergalactic journey, right? It has limited supplies which puts an emphasis on the efficient usage of water, food, air, resources. Uh, it also implies that actions in one part of the spaceship can have a significant impact and consequence on other parts and different subsystems, like the life support systems from oxygen generation to water management, to growing food, uh, to thermal systems to keep us warm and power systems to keep us, uh, keep us with electricity. So you can think of the Earth and its biosphere as our spaceship. So you can think of Earth and its systems kind of in this way, right? So we have Earth as a whole system, and it's made up of various different interconnected subsystems. And these are the life support mechanisms of our planet, responsible for maintaining stable temperatures, providing clean air and clean water, facilitating the movement of water and nutrients, and sustaining healthy ecosystems. Now, all of these elements work together. They enable both humans and animals to thrive on this planet. And, and these, in, um, in integrated Earth system science, they are known as Earth sy system tipping points. So these are large biophysical systems that have really special functions uh, within the Earth system at global, regional, and local scales that keep everything in balance, in an equilibrium. Um, so from our current understanding, at least, we know of at least 25 of these different Earth system tipping points um, that have been identified from um, evidence of past changes, observational records, and different computer models. Uh, if you look at the cryosphere, which is everything ice and snow, we see six of these tipping points, which include uh, the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets. In the biosphere, we see, which is everything living, we see 16 of these tipping points. 
And these include things like the forest dieback, which we see in the Amazon forest, uh, the savanna and dryland degradation, lake eutrophication, die off of coral reefs and, and mangroves. Um, but essentially, these systems act as a vital support network for Earth and their failure uh, could lead to a domino effect. So the interconnectedness and such interactions between these Earth systems can destabilize each other, potentially triggering a chain reaction of tipping cascades. So what do I mean then by fail? How do these systems fail? So we run the risk of when we put pressure on these systems, we can hit a critical threshold at which uh, any additional input into a system triggers this disproportionately large and, and often abrupt and irreversible change, uh, which leads to a, a tipping point behavior from one state to another. So, for example, like a forest to a savanna-like state, from ice to no ice, from self-cooling to self-heating, um, and from carbon sink to like a carbon source. And so these are known as kind of feedback mechanisms. It is a closed loop of causality where a change in the system feeds back to amplify or dampen that change. Um, and this comes in kind of two forms, whether it is the reinforcement of a positive feedback loop, but actually you can also see this happening with a dampening or balancing aspect of a negative feedback. So when I talk about thinking in systems, this is what I'm talking about. I'll try and help uh, guide you through this as well with an example. Um, so as we see global temperatures rise, um, this leads to more wildfires, which in turn burns forests and trees. Now, that process releases more CO2 into the atmosphere, while also then um, diminishing our carbon sinks, which consequently has an impact, impact on more global warming. Another scenario is the melting of ice due to the increased temperatures and reducing Earth's white surfaces that normally reflect sunlight back into space. So as a result of the melting, there is less white surface. Um, and so the Earth absorbs more of this solar heat, further escalating this planetary warming. Um, however, of course, the situations are usually more complex than it appears at first glance. Uh, as you can see by this diagram, um, it actually involves more of a blend of natural and social factors. Uh, and, and this particular system map, for example, describes the mechanisms involved in forest dieback uh, within the Amazon forest. So these scenarios, what they really represent are runaway effects. And once initiated, uh, might be completely beyond our control, risking completely irreversible change. And moreover, the interconnected nature of Earth subsystems could lead to these cascading effects. Uh, to help facilitate this, I'll give you a very, very quick example here. Um, so if you if we start at the top left, what we see is the Greenland ice sheet warming about four times quicker than the rest of the planet, which will lead to a large flux of fresh water being released into the North Atlantic. This reduces the density of the surface seawater and thus weakens the deep convection. So this slows down the AMOC, which is one of Earth's system tipping points. And what that does, it can cause a shift in the intertropical convergence zone. Basically, what that means, it just uh, has the possibility of affecting weather patterns within the Amazon region. Um, so that could then accelerate short term Earth system impacts such as fires, droughts, floods that undermine planetary resi uh, resilience and push tipping points like the Amazon forest closer to its own critical threshold. Um, so. In short, the loss and the melting of a Greenland ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet has the possibility to then increase forest fires, droughts and floods happening in the forest, uh, in the Amazon forest and thus pushing this ecosystem um, uh, closer to its critical threshold. And this is just one example of the interconnectedness of these Earth systems. But OK, I mean, one might ask. Surely this is a future problem, right? We're talking very large scale things here. We're not really that close to surpassing some of these critical thresholds. Surely we're not triggering these, these feedback mechanisms. So this is perhaps one of the scariest graphs I've come across when researching integrated earth system science. Um, 
what we see is each of these Earth system tipping points uh, has a temperature threshold beyond which you trigger these feedback mechanisms and put irreversible change into action. And this is what this graph is. It maps the, the temperature threshold against some of these large biophysical systems. So I will try to explain it to you here. So on the left, you have each Earth's, uh, Earth system. The numbers on the top represent the global temperature increase since pre-industrial times. And what I want to do is draw your attention to the yellow vertical line. This donates the current level of global warming, um, which is now at 1.2 degrees. And I also want to draw your attention to the blue bar, which is uh, the 1.5 and 2 degrees climate targets, uh, the range within the Paris Agreement. Now notice how the top five Earth systems, uh, the white data points, is already sitting at the 1.5 degrees of warming um, and, and many other falling within the 1.5 and 2 degrees range. So from this graphic, you can conclude that five of these climate tipping elements uh, are already in the danger zone within the 1.1 and 1.5 temperature range that we, we already exist within. And then another further five are already at risk under the Paris Agreement of 1.5 and 2 degrees limits. And just to remind you that surpassing these thresholds may trigger reinforcing um, feedback mechanisms, causing their collapse, which in turn could lead to these runaway impacts and destabilize the entire Earth system. And, and we cannot currently rule out that some systems, like the Greenland ice sheet, may have already been crossed. This threshold may have already been crossed. And a, and a runaway feedback mechanism is already in motion. So this implies that, um, uh, like uh, as Johan Rockström points out, who is a very revered climate scientist, that the 1.5 degrees threshold and temperature limit is a physical limit of our planet and not a political target. So what Earth Systems Science has revealed to us that there are um, very clear biological and physical boundaries um, to what the current human political, economic, and social structures can sustainably extract from the Earth. Um, and surpassing these boundaries could adversely affect life support systems and then potentially lead into this irreversible shift away from the planet's stable conditions we've just spoken about. So back in September last year, Johan Rockström and his, and his team um, published an updated planetary boundary framework. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it um, in the past two days. Um, and they've managed to quantify all of the boundaries. And what they've discovered is that we've transgressed six of these boundaries really quite significantly, which shows that our current economies, our lifestyles, are putting very unsustainable pressure onto Earth systems. And what I like about this framework as well is it brings us out of our carbon tunnel vision. You can see that in the top left where you see climate change, that is only one of the boundaries right? One of the nine. So when we talk about the phase out of fossil fuels, we talk about reducing the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. We've still got eight other boundaries to deal with. Um, so I don't plan to give you a lecture on all of the details. You can check out the, the plant-based treaties uh, report um, for this, but I wanted to cover some of the key aspects, notably because what we see is that our global food system with animal agriculture in particular um, not only impacts all of the nine boundaries, but is responsible for transgression of five of these Earth system boundaries. Um, and I've added little uh, uh, small symbols to indicate which ones they are. So I just wanted to cover a few of these in a little bit of detail so you get a feel for it. So if we were to look at land system change, for example, we see that agricultural ecosystems cover more than about 40% of the global land surface, which makes agricultural land one of the largest terrestrial biomes on the planet. Uh, and ag animal agriculture, in fact, takes up 83% of it, which is an enormous amount. If we look at biosphere integrity, we see the functional uh, and the genetic diversity have been in rapid decline, um, primarily driven by land and sea use, um, which in, in effect is driven by the expansion of agriculture and the exploitation of uh, marine ecosystems but also from the direct exploitation of organisms as well, such as fishing. Um, one of the most important things here is um, 
biodiversity is, is a pillar to ecosystem functions. One of those functions being the pollination of the food that we grow. Um, and what we see is that at least 70% of all of the world's crops relies on some extent of in insects for pollination as well. So we're, this is a critical function that we are desperately losing. Fresh water, um, we see that um, agriculture, particularly crop production for animal feed, is responsible for taking up the 70% of global fresh water withdrawals. And if we look at the biogeochemical biogeochem flows as well, which are your nitrogen and your phosphorus cycles, um, these are also primarily driven by agriculture due to the high demands uh, in the production of meat, dairy, uh, and crops for animal feed and food. So if we look at the anth anthropogenic use of nitrogen and phosphorus, which is in the form of fertilizer, we see that it consumes approximately 86% to 96% of global stocks, respectively, which is a really an unprecedented amount. So, as you might be able to judge by now, our global food system has this pivotal role to play. Um, not only will it bring us back within the uh, safe operating space of our planetary boundaries, but it is also a future carbon sink and as a fundamental agent in regenerating and strengthening the biosphere's resilience. Um, there were a couple of key messages I wanted to, to get over to everyone today, which emphasize on the importance of the phase out of, of animal agriculture. But of course, the details are in, in our report as well. So one of the one of the main key messages we, we found was that even if we were to phase out fossil fuels today, um, uh, Emissions from our food system alone are enough to put these 1.5 and 2 degrees climate targets completely out of reach. So whatever happens with a fossil fuel phase out, we will have to transform our food system regardless. Another key message that we found is the reason that we get given a carbon budget in the first place is because the IPCC climate models are already optimistically assuming that um, um, our global food system goes from emitting four gigatons of carbon to absorbing five gigatons of carbon within the next two and a half decades. That's going from carbon source to carbon sink in 25 years, which is an unprecedented amount of land system change over an unprecedented short amount of time. Um, revered climate scientists like, like Johan Rockström calls this an agricultural revolution that needs to occur. And we see nothing on the international stage that, that pushes us in that direction yet. We also see that our global food system is the largest uh, greenhouse gas em emitting sector responsible for more than a third um, of, of GHG emissions in CO2 equivalent. Uh, if we were to look at methane specifically, we see that our global food system is also responsible for 54% of anthrop anthropogenic methane emissions. Now, this includes 36% from animals raised for food, 10% from rice cultivation, and 8% from food waste. And now the important thing we, why we need to talk about methane is because of its global warming potential. Uh, methane is about 82 times more potent than CO2 at warming over a 20-year time frame. And considering its 12-year lifetime in, in our atmosphere, it is also our best opportunity at slowing down warming to buy us enough time to be able to decarbonize our global economies. So it's an extraordinarily unique opportunity that we have to keep us at least close to the 1.5. Uh, as just discussed, the global food system impacts all of the nine boundaries. So it's quite holistic in, in the way we tackle these things, um, but it transgresses five in the biosphere. So it is really quite uh, invasive and is the single largest sector contributing to environmental degradation. And, and finally, the point I want to make here as well is how inefficient our global food system is. Because it's so based around animal agriculture currently, what we see is animal products provide just 37% of global protein, 18% of global calories, but is responsible for 83% of the land use, farmed land use and 71% of global deforestation. Okay, so let, let's briefly look at our current status regarding the carbon budget. So the carbon budget was designed to guide the decarbonization of our global economies. And what it essentially tells us is how much carbon we're allowed to emit 
to main temperatures, uh, temperature increases within this 1.5 and 2 degrees targets. Um, so very quickly, what you see on the screen, on the left was a study done in 2020, just to compare um, the food emissions against uh, the carbon budget at that time, um, which was to kind of back up my previous slide of, of the claim that we need to uh, uh, also phase out animal culture as well as fo fossil fuels. But since then, there have been updates to the carbon budget, which is what we see on the right in 2023. There are initiatives to make sure these numbers are updated every single year now. And, and what we see is that to have a 67% chance of staying under the 1.5 degrees, uh, the estimated carbon budget is about 150 gigatons from last year, which based on current annual projections, and uh, we, we're using 3% of, of this budget every single year, um, every single month, this will likely be used up by 2026. That is two years away until we run out of our, our, our carbon budget. Now, if we extend that slightly and just look at uh, the current trend suggesting that a, a rise in the global temperatures that occur at 0.23 degrees per decade, we potentially reach this 1.5 degrees by uh, 2034. And just to remind you, this is a physical limit of our planet. So um, this indicates that we are at a very critical juncture on the brink of possibly destabilizing Earth systems. Um, in, in fact, <laughs> the carbon budget is now essentially redundant as we've now spent it. Um, uh, but so what's now urgently needed is this radical, deep, uh, systemic transformation, unprecedented in both scale and speed, you know, we've left climate action far too late. So then the question arises, uh, how should we approach this in the 21st century? What framework can we guide us through this essential systemic reform? And now, fortunately, uh, there are some brilliant minds working on this. Uh, a notable example is Kate Raworth's donor economics model. Um, so this model integrates a planetary boundary framework with a social foundation that is derived from the UN SDGs, ensuring that our global transformation is both uh, environmentally safe and socially just. Um, and this forms the basis of the plant-based treaties donut approach. Um, and, and the key idea, or, or rather the question we had, was whether we could apply this to our global food system. Um, and, and on this note, I'll hand over to Anita to continue the presentation. Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, and thank you, Climate Healers, for inviting us. Um, so we recognized that there was a missing framework to connect everything and draw a pathway to phase out animal farming and reforest the earth. So we took uh, inspiration from Kate Raworth, an Oxford economist. Um, the vegan donut economics uh, model that we're using uh, is, is about transforming the food system. Um, and we selected 12 uh, social boundaries. Um, the plant-based treaty has 40 uh, detailed proposals, but we decided to focus on 12 of those. The outer ring of the donut um, has the um, uh, planetary boundaries, and uh, six of the nine planetary boundaries have already been breached, um, and uh, two others are on their way to being breached. Only one is recovering the ozone layer, and animal farming impacts all nine planetary boundaries in a negative way. Um, with respect to the inner boundaries, the social foundations, um, some of the aspects that we focus on are in what we call the three R's. So the first R is relinquish, don't make the problem worse. Uh, so we have, for example, protect indigenous rights, stop live exports. R2 is redirect. Um, so we have some of the uh, uh, social boundaries that we focused on was redirecting finance from supporting animal farming to supporting uh, plant-based food systems, uh, food security, um, health, and other areas. And then finally, rewild. Uh, we looked at greening cities um, and reforesting the earth. In the next slide, I just want to emphasize uh, that mammal biomass um, in this particular uh, graphic shows that uh, measured in tons of carbon, 
uh, for, in the year 2015, wild animals are only 4% of global mammal biomass. Humans are 34% and farmed animals are 62%. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, can you can you go to the next slide as well? Sorry, I think we're and that that's the one. Yeah, and then the next one shows the next slide um, shows uh, the growth in um, global per capita meat consumption. Um, so it has grown steadily since the 1980s, from 30 kilograms per person per year in the early 1980s to 45 kilograms per person per year in the early 2020s. Um, and this is part of what is called the great acceleration um, or the hockey stick, uh, which is discussed in Rockstrom Gaffney's book, Breaking Boundaries. So this, this uh, growth of meat production in such a short time has had devastating impacts on the planetary boundaries, such as the forest, freshwater, biodiversity, eutrophication and ocean dead zones. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows uh, some of the projections in the rise of consumption of chickens and other birds by 66%, eggs by almost 60%, cow and buffalo products by almost 60% as well. These projected uh, ex growth, uh, growth in, uh, in animal agriculture products uh, would have dire consequences. Um, in terms of radical land use change, exacerbated greenhouse gas emissions, uh, increased air and water pollution, and uh, overuse of fresh water. The next slide uh, shows per capita consumption of, uh, of meat in a number of countries. And it shows, for example, uh, in the West, the USA, New Zealand, Spain, Germany, Italy, and Canada have huge emissions, huge, huge consumption of meat. In the US, it's 124 kilograms per person per year, uh, much larger than the Japanese average, which is 49 kilograms. Uh, Eastern European countries also have very high consumption. Uh, for example, in Poland, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Hungary. Uh, it also shows some countries in the global south, such as Argentina at 109 kilograms, Brazil at 100 kilograms. Um, the number one spot is Hong Kong at 137 kilograms um, and also high consumption in Mongolia and Taiwan. In the next slide, um, this shows uh, Cargill's revenue and profits. And it, it's grown in 2010 from a, a roughly 100 billion to 177 billion uh, 13 years later in 2023. So the reason I wanted to show you um, the per capita meat consumption, uh, the revenue of, of you know one of the, the largest uh, slaughterhouse and commodity trading firms. And, and then next, I wanna show you the indigenous, next slide, I wanna show you the indigenous, um, some of the stats with respect to deaths of land defenders is because it draws a picture because we know that a lot of plant-based companies like Beyond Meat and even uh, plant-based milks, their shares have fallen while you see the growth in these companies. And, and there's a reason for this. Like um, companies like Cargill have targets like getting a hundred million people in Asia to adopt backyard chickens by 2030. So they're, on, they, they're using their billions and billions in profits to invest in trying to transform plant-based, largely plant-based societies into eating more meat. So I just want to draw a picture of how serious the problem is so that, you know, that, that will help us in, you know, working towards a solution. Um, so in this particular chart, you'll see that indigenous people make up only 5% of the world's population, um, yet they safeguard 80% of the planet's biodiversity and suffer 36% of the killings uh, of land, def land defenders worldwide. So at least 1,390 killings of land defenders have taken place since the adoption of the Paris Accords. And this, this, this chart shows that Global Witness, uh, the nonprofit in 2023 identified the drivers of the killings of land defenders. And in 2022, they were linked to agribusiness 
uh, you know, 10, 10 killings, and that's more than any other sector. So any growth in the demand for meat and dairy globally, um, which is driving uh, agricultural expansion into old growth forests would further harm um, not only by biodiversity uh, farmed animals, but also land defenders in the Amazon. In the next slide, um, I wanna now focus on what the plant-based treaty is doing. Our mission is to promote a shift towards a, a just plant-based food system that would enable us to live safely within our planetary boundaries and reinforce the earth. Our vision is a global plant-based treaty attached to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to enable plant-based food systems. Our values incorporate deep ecology and climate justice, a democratic organization, uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a globally representative team of or organizers and fostering local uh, leadership. We have five programs. Uh, one is we collect endorsements and um, in the chat, we'll put a link to the homepage where you can endorse as an individual group or business. Um, and by collecting millions of endorsements uh, from individuals, celebrity scientists, politicians, tens of thousands of groups and businesses and hundreds of cities, potentially, that would uh, create pressure for a global treaty. We have a city program. Um, we have a menu change and public education program, uh, an advocacy program where at the global climate talks. So th this report that we're talking about today is part of that global program. And we also have training and webinars. And um, this triangle, this pyramid shows the structure. So the, the grand strategic objective is at the top, you know, to transform our food system to plant-based so that we live in our planetary boundaries. We have the three R's, don't make the problem worse, relinquish, redirect, sort of solve the problem with economic and political and educational instruments like taxes, subsidies, public information campaigns, restore and rewild. And then under that, you can have hundreds of campaigns under each of those and then hundreds of nonviolent tactics. In the next slide, um, so you see there are three core principles, relinquish, redirect, and restore. So you can read our treaty on our website and under each R, we have detailed proposals and altogether there are 40 detailed proposals. Um, in the next slide, um, so one of the solutions that we see as, you know, as part of transforming the food system to plant-based and that we included in our vegan donut economics is transforming um, uh, the educational system and public information campaigns. But what there was a study called uh, the People's Climate Vote, and it shows that around the world, people do not understand one, the relationship between food and climate, and two, the significant contributions of food emissions. So this survey, the People's Vote, uh, contacted 100, sorry, 1.2 million people. And um, they, they were shown 18 proposals on actions and they were asked to rank them in terms of what would be the greatest impact for the, the climate action. And veganism fared at the bottom, even though it was the number one solution in terms of personal impact. So it just shows you how far we have to go in terms of education. In the next slide, I wanted to show you a positive um, public information campaign that ran for only one month, unfortunately, but a very powerful campaign by New York City's uh, Mayor Eric Adams. It's called Eat a Whole Lot More Plants. And it was it educated the public through radio, outdoor, outdoor billboards, and digital media. And it focused on neighborhoods grappling with health and socioeconomic inequity. Um, and uh, the initiative went further. It encouraged residents to engage with the city for nutritional questions, uh, ensuring full support with a transition to a plant-based diet. The next slide uh, shows uh, subsidies. Uh, it's an overview for OECD countries, so sort of the developed, so-called developed countries and non-OECD countries. And in the red and um, blue are meat and dairy. And you can see by country in some of the OECD and non-OECD countries, how, 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 how many billions are spent on uh, the, the subsidizing that. So you can see for different countries, uh, the green is subsidies for uh, fruits and vegetables. 
and and you can see how how dominant um, the subsidies are for for uh, meat and dairy there, and how this we need to reduce that to zero and subsidize you know the solution. The next couple of slides also show um, how perverse the incentive structure is. So in this one, you can see the biggest creditors to meat and dairy. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, global meat and dairy companies received almost half a trillion in backing from more than 2,500 investment firms, banks, and pension funds headquartered around the world. And in this particular chart, you can see the top creditors, BNP, Barclays, JP, JP Morgan. And you can see that's just over 15 billion for uh, those three. The next slide shows the biggest investors in meat and dairy, BlackRock, Capital, Vanguard, Sun Life, Norwegian government pension funds. So again, so as part of the donut economics, we put these in our interim and we're pointing to what needs to change so that we move and towards a plant-based food system. In the next slide, uh, uh, Rich, this is based on a, an article by Richie, and it notes that Earth has lost one third of its for forest cover and only 4 billion hectares of forest remain. Um, 10,000 years ago, 71% of the Earth's surface was covered by forests, shrubs, and wild grasslands. And there's a direct correlation between an agricultural, animal agricultural expansion and forest loss. Only 38% of the earth is covered in forest and 14% in wild grasslands and shrubs. 46% uh, of the land that was once covered by forest with gra wild grasslands and shrubs is today used for agriculture, the vast majority for animal farming and animal feed. Um, in the next slide, um, the current global diet uses 4 billion hectares of land and results in a lot of wasteful land use. Um, for example, 43% of cropland is used to raise farmed animals rather than feed humans directly. And some of the big takeaways, which Steve already discussed, uh, are um, that 83% of the global farming land is used for animal farming, yet it produces only 18% of the world's calories and 37% of total protein based on a study by Poor and Nemesic. Um, and one of the most important takeaways uh, in terms of if we switch to a plant-based food system, we could save 75% of the land use. So instead of using 4 billion hectares of land for agriculture, we would only use 1 billion hectares of land. And we could reforest 3 billion or, or, or you know, restore. Um, so... Um, Land use, according to George Mobiot and Dr. Salash Rao's work, land use is one of the most important environmental issues to focus on. Um, so the next slide shows uh, Dr. Shireen Kassam's work on um, a plant-based eat well guide. So in the UK, there's an official eat well guide that is mostly plant-based, but not entirely. And uh, Dr. Shireen Kassam improved on the guide by making it completely plant-based. So it's called the Plant-Based Eat Well Guide. Uh, so that so the UK dietary policies should 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 switch to completely plant-based. And there was a recent systemic systematic um, uh, review of the UK's guide, and it found that it was incompatible with our planetary boundaries. Um, if the UK population consumed the diet recommended by e the, e the official Eat Well Guide, it would not stay within the boundaries for greenhouse gases, water use, land use, and eutrophication. The report found that incorporating environmental sustainability into the guide, such as the plant-based Eat Well Guide, may be the first step towards the implementation uh, of population level policies to support a shift away from animal-based foods. Um, the, the, the guide shows the proportion in which foods from different food groups are needed to achieve a balanced and healthy diet. Um, and it states, quote, eat at least five portions of a variety of fruits and vegetables a day, but aim for more. Uh, as eating up to 10 portions a day has additional benefits for health. 
uh, 10 portions per day would be double what who, who suggests or the World Health Organization. Um, next slide, please. This is a slide from Joseph Poor and it shows the benefits of just one person, that's just you or I, switching to an entirely plant-based diet. It would be equivalent of cutting your carbon footprint by 50%, making it the single biggest thing an individual could do. It also save five birds, 15 mammals, 20 reptiles, 100 amphibians, and spare 4.7 thousand um, uh, meters square. The next slide shows uh, our city campaign. So as I mentioned, we one of our programs is collecting endorsements to create bottom-up pressure for a global agreement. But we also want to see meaningful local action. And we already have 25 cities that have endorsed from Edinburgh to Los Angeles to uh, Amsterdam. So we, we run city campaigns. And if you're interested in joining, we have welcoming calls every Friday at 10 and 2 p.m. EST. And uh, we can uh, post the link in the chat for you to register for a welcoming call. Um, and one of the ways that we get cities to endorse is through our email action campaign. So we, we send emails to all the counselors in our city. So we'll post that link. So if you could kindly uh, participate in this program and send an email to your counselors. And the final slide shows, what if Edinburgh a population of half a million went vegan? It would save the size of size of Lake District National Park, or 232,000 hectares. So it's incredible, uh, you know, the power of changing our food system to entirely plant-based as soon as possible, which is what the Climate Healers is, has been calling for. And uh, you know, when we join you in that call, uh, thank you very much. Outstanding presentation, both of you. Thank you very much uh, for putting all that together. What? You have a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, Anita, for just amazing work as usual. I found your slides pretty loaded with information and I wonder if you can have a presentation with much simpler slides because some of the slides are too much information. What I'm looking for is in just a concrete steps which people can take to either go vegan or and ask their city officials to go vegan because you know that's it's a lot confusing and a lot complex. Uh, as you know, I have called our city mayor and begged them to sign the plant-based treaty and have had no success. So, and, and as you know, so we need to operationalize it as to what's the next steps, guidance or a checklist or a, or a script for people to follow uh, some of the key points of this information to get the job done, so to speak. So really appreciate your leadership and thanks again for both of you to, for an amazing presentation. Did, did you want us to answer that now or? Yeah, you can answer that if you need a okay. response to that. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Um, so so what we found um, in terms of what works, like well, how did we get Edinburgh to do, to, to have mm -hmm. a meaningful um, motion? So in the case of LA, all they did was a resolution. So it didn't have substance, it was symbolic. So after that, we decided to focus on meaningful measures, which are bills, which take mm -hmm. more time. So. In the case of Edinburgh, somebody sent the email action in 2000, and, uh, I think it was 2022, and a Green Councillor said, oh, introduce the motion, and they, they said, no, do an impact assessment. So the city did an impact assessment of the 40 proposals, and then it took about eight months or so to uh, finish that impact assessment, and then they passed it in January of 2023, and now they're working on an action plan, and they introduced that this month. They passed an action plan. So mm -hmm. it, it is quite a process, it takes time, but cities are very responsive. And, and so what, what, So we, in the case of UK, we've had thousands of people send these email actions. We've had support from Veganuary, Viva, 
VegFest UK. So in the UK, they already have five cities and towns. In the US, we're just beginning to like mobilize that kind of uh, campaign. So we did data collection. Our team did data collection for all the cities. So if you go to plantbasedtreaty.org and go to action page, no matter which state you live in, you can go to the state and send an email. So we, we've just started that campaign. So we don't have a lot of traction yet, but um, we ask people to come to welcoming calls and set up a team. And uh, you know, your idea is excellent. Like we could have a checklist and show you, you know, what are the steps that you need to take to succeed. Awesome, thank you so much. And I, and I love the fact that, you know, India and the UK have the two highest concentration of cities because that's where I'm focusing right now, <laughs> the two places. I think uh, we need to tip over. Okay, Didi? Yeah, hi, um, thank you very much. Um, so I, I work at, uh, I, I volunteer at the, at the local level in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and, uh, and, and I also find that, um, it's, it's very satisfying, much more satisfying than working at the federal level or the provincial level, um, because, well, it's just more manageable, you know, like you can actually talk to people and, um, and, and, and what you do uh, has an impact. Um, uh, Mary Surumi of Plant-Based Treaty has, uh, approached, uh, the city of Ottawa and, uh, the universities, hear about um, signing the plant-based treaties and also working with the organization that I work with um, uh, for on the environment, uh, which is um, called cafes. Um, and uh, and and they have, you know they they haven't um, you know signed signed the treaty. Um, but cafes, I was at a, a a workshop yesterday. there were about three hundred people there. And they were handing out at plant-based treaty information, um, which is which is positive. Um, but what I wanted to ask and sort of building upon Watch's uh, question is um, the, the project that I'm working on with, uh, with cafes is uh, climate disinformation rebuttals. So they have, uh, so we have about 25 files, including uh, the IPC is, is, is garbage. Um, and, um, that the 15 minute uh, cities are, you know, like they're, they're a conspiracy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, to a conspiracy to trap people in their neighborhoods. <laughs> so, so, um, so there is, I think a lot of climate, uh, uh, disinformation related to, uh, food, uh, the most obvious of which is climate change is only related to fossil fuels. It's not related to animal agriculture. Um, and uh, another one, which I think is um, even uh, sillier, uh, is not related to climate change, is uh, we need to, uh, the, a factory farm or animals are safe on farms, otherwise they would go extinct. Um, so there are so many sort of um, myths about uh, animal agriculture. And um, would you be uh, interested in putting together a list of sort of you know, uh, sort of things that people run into when when they talk to um, municipal, in particular, municipal uh, government officials, and you know, speaking points, so that um, you know, so that people can um, uh, address these uh, address these uh, concerns. And the other thing I want to know is, are you co uh, cooperating with plants plant based cities, um, which uh, plant based cities movement? Um, yeah, uh, and the Canadian uh, Universities uh, Initiative. Uh... Okay. I don't know if Steve wanted to answer, address any of the uh, the the sort of more the, the mythology that we need to address and maybe get a Q and you know, mm -hmm. sort of give some speaking points. Uh, you mean that the disinformation situation, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a huge problem. And it would only it's only going to increase in in severity. So there has to be, alongside all of this, mass education programs, um, ways that we can target disinformation, right? But this is also a much broader movement of education because these people who buy into the conspiracy theories, who buy into the disinformation, are also most likely to buy into the other conspiracy theories as well, like no um uh moon landings for example i get a lot of that um from, from my angle and flat earthers and stuff like that so the disinformation is extraordinarily important there has to be an, an entire campaign 
dedicated to to um, stamping uh, this this disinformation out, but it is also a wider movement of education in any way. So, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a, it's a lot of work to do. So you, it's wise, I think, to get scientists on board to help spread um, valuable information. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually teaching a course on the climate healer story, and uh, we are going through all of the disinformation that came out of the Oxford debates. Mm -hmm. The Oxford debate had the other side was pouring it out. Yeah, and I've asked my class to you know address each one of those and and see how they would respond to it. Uh, I mean, it is also worth pointing out as well is as our movement is also susceptible to these things as well, cherry picking mm -hmm. data. So. We'll, we also need to be careful that we don't cherry pick our own data to support our own movement. And then we're just fighting the same battle. But if you take a, the scientific approach, the scientific method and, and present the data as is, it should do the, argu the, the arguing for us, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ray, you're on next. Great presentation, guys. I'm going to watch it again and again. And uh, I'm assuming this is something that we would eventually be able to present at some point. Yes, like yes, the, the 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 we can share the PowerPoint presentation if anyone wants to give it and adjust it. Yeah, that's fine. That would be wonderful. And, we appreciate it. Anita and I took uh, Al Gore's training at the same time, so we took that mm -hmm. presentation and modified it. Uh, and uh, this one doesn't require the same kind of modification. But my question is, uh, uh, and and this may test the conspiracy theory ideas again. Uh, the story from the beginning has been about fossil fuels and uh, regardless of what we've known about agriculture. So this political decision that uh, we can end the fossil fuel industry, but the agriculture industry is untouchable. That seems like a, a logical conclusion. If you think about the early days of, of trying to prove that climate change was real, right? We had to prove it was real. And then we had to prove that it was anthropogenic that we were doing it. And they they made a political decision that they thought the fossil fuel industry isn't near and dear to people's hearts like the food industry is. So let's remove the fossil fuel industry and channel all of our energy into that. And I think they bet poorly. I think the fossil fuel industry is very hard and we're addicted to it in ways that we aren't literally in a, you know thinking about it all the time. But uh, I think the food industry is something that can change and must change and will change organically. Like the planetary boundaries have had set limits. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have a choice. We have to change it. Whereas right. the, the fossil fuel industry is a political battle forever. So um, I don't know. Does that sound like a conspiracy theory? <laughs> no, th this is interesting because I, I think it was only three years ago or so was fossil fuels actually brought up in negotiations at COP. And we've had COP for 28 years. So only very recently have we managed to bring the discussion of fossil fuels to the table. Um, so it's been inherently very difficult in the first place. But usually these things have an exponential momentum to them, right? Uh, the other important thing to, to note as well is fossil fuel infrastructure is so embedded within our societies that it is extraordinarily difficult politically, economically, structurally to phase it out so there's always going to be a long battle to its phase out it's in everything we do it's in all the plastics that we use it's all the energy production so we need this momentum for the phase out the difference between that and the food system right is we individuals have the agency to change that ourselves we have that choice three three times a day right so we can accelerate that change extraordinarily quickly and it's less embedded within our economies and, 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 our, and our systems that you can have that rapid transformation as i was mentioning the ipcc has already assumed it to become a carbon sink within 25 years and there's no movement on that so that it has to happen extraordinarily quickly um so it is but it's also worth noting it's not just about diet diet change right it's also about how we grow food we need to grow food differently because you can have a plant-based food system based on monoculture but that's still a biodiversity desert. That still is going to breach um, uh, the biosphere integrity boundary, for example. So it is multifaceted. It's very complex because the food system is a system of systems. It's not just 
environment, but it's social, it's economic, it's political, and it's all of these points. So it also is very, very complex. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... <laughs> Yeah, it, it, yeah, absolutely. Tammy? Uh, our next guest is here. <laughs> oh. Our next, I think, oh yeah, that's right. So we'll close it off with Tammy as the last question. Sorry, Paige and Anand. Unmute. Now I can. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I won't ask a question. I will contact you personally, Anita and Stephen. And thank you so much for the presentation. And, you know, Anita, I, I started um, hanging out <laughs> with the climate healers a few years ago. And I remember this treaty just kind of beginning. And and you took, you know, you took a, a dream, a, a vision, and you turned it into something so powerful. And for us right now, the inspiration and creative action is what is changing everything. And so just want to say thank you so much for that creative vision and the ability to put it together and and show up over and over again because it does make a difference it makes a huge difference and it gives us all something to work towards everywhere i go uh, that we're promoting veganism the plant-based treaty is there now like in at earth day in the, in edmonton you know the plant-based treaty was a very big part of it and a very big uh, uh connection to the people understanding that and there were a lot of on Earth Day, there were a lot of people walking past and talking about soil, you know, a lot of soil. And it's it's just so easy to grab the information that you have worked, been so dedicated at putting together. So I know it's been a lot of hard work and dedication. And I just want to thank you very much for that vision and bringing it forward. And yes. and um, any way the, the Million Vegan Grandmothers can support you, please let us know. We are so happy to support you. Yeah, thank you so much. I just wanted to say it's like a huge team effort. And a lot of the team is on the call now, like Nicola from the UK did the website, which is incredible. And the, and uh, Ellen worked on the LA campaign. Steve volunteered his time, like he was working nights, like 16 hour days after his European Space Agency job and weekends, he went to cop for us. So I just wanted to be like, the only reason it's a success is because of people like yourself, and everybody mm -hmm. here that make it happen. So that's it's a team effort. But thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry to end the discussion here, but I'll get in touch with you later about any discrepancies in data. Thank you.